On February 12, 2020, the United States Medical Licensing Examiners, USMLE, announced that step one would be transitioning to pass-fail no earlier than January 1st, 2022. Now, to put in perspective how big a deal this is, think about an exam that every medical student in the country has to take. They spend an entire two years preparing for this exam because the score that they get more or less determines their future in the medical field. If you wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, for example, you had to get above a certain score on this exam. And if you failed to do so, your dream of being that doctor that you went to medical school to be now becomes in jeopardy. Now, you want to talk about a pressured situation. Few things impacted the trajectory of your medical career quite like this exam, and now it's completely pass-fail, meaning that residency programs won't know if you scored in the 50th percentile or the 99th percentile. They'll just know whether or not you passed the exam. On April 20th of this year, the USMLE announced that all Step 1 exams taken on or after January 26th, 2022 will officially be pass-fail, which means that I will be in that first class of students who will be experiencing this change. And because historically, those first two years of your medical school experience were essentially just preparing for this exam, there's going to naturally be a few changes in how you should approach these preclinical years of your medical school experience. And today, that's what we're going to be talking about. What's up YouTube? If you're new here, my name is J.R. Smith and I am a medical student at the Mayo Clinic. I started medical school with the assumption that step one would be pass fail for me based on the initial announcement in January 2020. But now that it's official, I thought that I would share a few things that you may want to consider if you're a student taking this pass fail version of this exam. First, let's understand why step one was such a big deal. In an article written in 2016, years before this change, the author Dr. Jaya Kumar from the University of Pennsylvania said, while the content of USMLE Step 1 may not optimally focus on clinically relevant areas, the steps remain the sole standardized instruments by which residency programs can evaluate and reliably compare applicants. Consequently, to deny access to numerical scores would likely place residencies at a significant disadvantage. So clearly transitioning to a pass-fail format for Step 1 has been something the USMLE has been considering for quite some time now, but it presents a notable challenge for residency programs. This was the primary objective and standardized method that residency programs would compare applicants. Again, this was why so much was riding on this exam, but at least it gave students a clear understanding of how they would be assessed and some of the most important things they can do for their candidacy. But now with Step 1 carrying significantly less weight, I think students should make a subtle shift in the way that they approach their preclinical years. In medical school, you're Preclinical years are the years spent primarily in the classroom or in this day and age on Zoom, establishing a foundation of medical knowledge. At most medical schools, this is the first two years or so and would end with students taking that step one exam before they proceed into their clinical years, which are spent primarily in the clinic or the hospital. So students would have this terrifying exam slowly creeping up on them over the course of two years. Now in a way, this could be beneficial. It could keep students honest with their studies and keeping up with their schoolwork, knowing that they really have to know the material that they're learning because step one is coming. But it could have also created a toxic approach to learning where students are learning more just to do well on an exam and less to really become competent in the material that will help them best serve their future patients. And when this happens, it can build on an already negative relationship students have with learning. Feeling it's a necessary evil and just a means to an end and not something to be enjoyed and appreciated. Now, in a field where you have to embrace lifelong learning, it is to everyone's benefit for you to actually enjoy this process. So now with step one being pass fail, I think students should approach learning from the mindset of internalizing the concepts and memorizing the thousands of things we have to memorize, not so that we can do well on a test, but so that we can be good at what we do. Notice I didn't say students shouldn't spend as much time studying or just not take studying as serious now. That's kind of the opposite of what I'm saying. I think by approaching learning with the focus on growing and not just the focus on doing well on a test, is actually taking it more serious than you would otherwise. And it will actually help you mature into that mindset of appreciating learning just for learning and not a means to an end. And by this subtle shift in the way that you approach your preclinical years, you'll probably learn more and definitely have a lot less stress. You will still be able to use all of the amazing resources that have historically prepared students for step one, but instead of feeling pressure to know every single detail or every bit of minutia, as my professors often call it, those resources will just be supplementary guides to direct your learning. So I think the first thing that students should do is appreciate what this change offers them and being able to approach learning in a more joyful and less toxic way. Now I think the other thing students should think about, and this probably comes a bit more naturally, is now what are residency programs going to use to differentiate between applicants? To best answer this question, let's look at what else outside of step one scores residency programs used to use to evaluate candidates. 
Luckily for us, the National Resident Matching Program conducts a survey of the program directors for the programs participating in the match and asks them which factors they use when they're selecting applicants to interview and rank. As you'd expect, Step 1 scores have been the most cited factor in selecting students to interview, as well as other personal characteristics such as leadership and evidence of professionalism and ethics. But there are other tangible things that residency programs have historically valued, and again, remember, Step 1 was so important because of its standardized nature. So by looking at some of the more standardized items on this list, we may be able to have a better idea of what residency programs will be looking for now that Step 1 is pass-fail. The first is Step 2 CK, which was already a major component, but now it is the last score standardized exam left. And again, history tells us how residency programs value standardized exams. Before you had two exams that you could balance your scores across, but now you just have this one, so you can expect how much more important this may be. I've talked to a few medical students and residents who have taken both step one and step two, and it's been a consensus that step two is both easier and more enjoyable for medical students. One of the things that I've been hearing a lot from people is that uh, step one is not as enjoyable as an experience as step two uh, for a few reasons, but I just wanted to hear if, if you think that that's accurate. Um, you know, you've taken both step one and step two. So from the perspective of a student who's done that, um, what would you say? Like, well, how would you compare the two? What are, what are some differences and which one did you enjoy better? Step one is a little bit more of the like minutia knowledge that you have to memorize the kind of piecemeal knowledge like biochemistry pharmacology those subject matters and i think that was that was for me at least what made it a little bit more uh intimidating because now i have to study these independent topics without a context i'm somebody that likes a story i'm a writer so mm -hmm. i like the story i like the context for the things that i'm kind of i'm learning and so for me just memorizing factoids was a little bit more difficult without the full context of the clinical picture mm -hmm. now step two is a lot more clinical picture heavy so you're going to see a patient with all these little elements but they fit in a bigger story that you can now understand as heart failure for mm -hmm. instance and then you can go from there and say what's the next step and so for me that was a lot easier to digest and study and process and logic through than just like minutia knowledge at that point which that was what it was to me because I was like I haven't put this together in a story just yet um right. and so for me that was why I really preferred step two and studying for it because of that context that was there because I had now learned everything from the first two years and then seen it in clinic and seen how it's handled in real life and so for people that are like tactile learners I think that's also something to think about because if you're in clinic and you've seen something being dealt with in real life it sticks and that's how I am the last question I have is what is the importance of really trying to do well on step one, even though it's pass fail? Is there any importance to it? Should students just kind of study just enough to pass or should students kind of take step one just as serious as they did before when it wasn't pass fail? I think about it this way. Step one is the same knowledge but the story is present in step two. So you still have to know the factoids. Now you just have to be able to not only know them, but piece them together in a story. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you can work on the knowledge piece very early on in step one, then fitting it together in a story will be that much quicker and easier for you come step two. And you won't have to do that much like, what was that weird genetic disease again that I can't remember? And they have to go back to step one knowledge. You see what I mean? It's kind of like when we talk about questions versus content content review for the MCAT and we tell people to do the questions because you need to learn how the test is structured aka the story to break that down now you still have to know the information but the structure is that much more important so you would be doing yourself a disservice to not prepare for step one as if it's not no longer relevant it's relevant the knowledge is still very relevant it's just presented a different way in step two it's more clinically based you know more because it's taken later in your medical school career it just seems like students generally enjoy this exam more which is to our benefit since it will surely carry more weight but what these students and residents have also emphasized is that the better you know your stuff for step one the easier it will be to do well on step two. So this goes back to that original point in spending these preclinical years learning as much as you can because it will ultimately benefit you in the long run. Another factor mentioned by residency program directors is letters of recommendation in that specialty. And this factor has actually been historically cited with the second most frequency behind step one scores. 
it means it is extremely valuable to begin developing relationships with mentors and faculty in a field that you're interested in. Whether you're shadowing or doing research, one of your goals should be to establish meaningful relationships with mentors who won't only provide guidance, but who will be able to speak personally to who you are and why that program director should want you. And the earlier you can establish these relationships, the better. In a mentorship manual for medical students, Dr. Kelsey Swanson of VCU School of Medicine said it best. A mentor also can serve as a resource for opportunities that may interest you, such as finding out more about a particular field of medicine, more opportunities for working with patients, or informing you of research opportunities. A mentor can also give you feedback on research projects or patient write-ups you may be doing. Finally, even if you feel you don't need a mentor now, you may later. If you do need some advice as you go through medical school, it best comes from someone who knows you well. Therefore, it is best to establish a relationship with a mentor before you feel you really need one. So spend those first two years seeking those mentors. Again, not just because they'll be great letter writers, but because the guidance and support that they'll be providing you is invaluable. And this ties into my last point, which is consider finding research opportunities to get involved in during your preclinical years. Now, some specialties value this more than others. For example, it was cited as an important factor by 50% of orthopedic program directors, but by only 8% of family medicine program directors. So this may apply more to some students than others, but again, with step one being pass-fail and residency programs looking for a number to help differentiate candidates, having a solid number of research experiences may be to your advantage. That can be publications, presentations, posters, etc. But with so many things being equal during those first two years of medical school, research experience may be a good way for you to distinguish yourself and really get the most out of those preclinical years. Especially with less pressure to know the minutia for step one, you may consider transferring the time that you would have been doing that to pursuing research opportunities. Research can also take months or even years to finish, so by starting early in your medical school career, you'll be more likely to have completed projects which will be much more valuable than those left unfinished. With most schools transitioning to pass-fail preclinical grades and now that step one is officially pass-fail, it can be challenging to know exactly how to approach these first two years of medical school that will set you up for the most success. But I think by shifting the way you perceive the process of learning, focusing on building really strong mentorship relationships, and potentially getting involved in research opportunities depending on your specialty of interest, will allow you to get the most out of your preclinical years in this new reality of pass-fail step one. But that's all I have for this video. Thank you guys for sticking around. I know it was a little longer than my other videos, but I think it's a very important topic. I hope you also thought it was an important and valuable topic and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure you smash that like button. And if you haven't yet, consider subscribing and tapping that bell so you don't miss any future uploads. I still can't believe I'm wrapping up my first year of medical school already and it's been such an honor and blessing to have you guys in this community every step of the way. We won't be slowing down anytime soon, but of course, keep evolving and I'll see you guys in the next one.